Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's very nice to be here with you all virtually. I'd like to welcome you from near and far to our online worship service. So let us begin this divine service with a prayer. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we come before thy throne of grace, and Lord, we want to thank you for so many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Thank you for giving us this, this format that we can meet together. And now, Lord, as we want to listen to your message, please let the words that I speak be not from me, but from you, dear Lord. And let the Holy Spirit enter my heart and the hearts of the hearers, that we may all be transformed and be ready for your soon coming. In Jesus' name we come and we pray. Amen. I would like to begin this morning's study with one of the most phenomenal and beautiful scenes that I personally like, and it's found in Acts chapter 7, starting with verse 54. Here we have Stephen, who has been speaking in a sermon for quite a bit in the, the previous chapters, and he's speaking to the Jews, and his words have such a power and the Holy Spirit is coming upon him. And we are told in Acts chapter 7, starting with verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Every time I read this, I am impressed with the mercy of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon Stephen at that time when he is suffering pretty cruel circumstances, having thro stones thrown at him. And yet, during that moment, the Lord takes away his pain and he is able to look up into heaven and see the Lord. And I have a question for this morning. What does it take to see God? That's why I entitled the sermon for today, Seeing God. What does it take to see the Lord? As we ponder this question, we have to look no further than Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. And the Lord tells us, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. For this morning, there is a message of hope. Everyone can see God. The Lord wants to work to bring purity to every single heart so that we, like Stephen and some of the examples we'll talk about, that we may see God altogether. When we look at a couple of other examples, we read in Matthew chapter 17, starting with verse 1, of some others who were able to see God. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with him. Why is this a message of hope? Because there's others, and not just one, who have already achieved, or have been given, rather, this purity of heart, and they were able to see God. And for this morning, I want us to focus specifically on the examples of Moses and Elijah as spoken there in the Bible, that they were present with Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. And when we read in Isaiah 1.18, how can we come to such a stage as these men came to? The Bible says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Though our sins have been so many, God promises us purity of heart during this time. God promises us that we can be as these men who all were able to see God. God wants us to see Him as well. And the Lord wants to magnify something. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, we are told that we have this treasure in earthen vessels as we are, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Christ wants us to learn a lesson. Christ wants us to learn, just as it says in James 5, verse 17, speaking of this man who is able to see God in one of the most glorious manifestations, in James 5, 17, speaking of Elijah, it says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. God wants us to know that just as Elijah, Elijah was just like us. And he was a man subject to like passions as we are. And yet God purified him. God purified him and he was able to be there on that mount of transfiguration. 
And I believe that for this morning, God has some lessons that we can learn both from Moses and Elijah who are present with uh, Jesus on the mount. So let us begin by looking at the example of Elijah, this great man of the Lord. Let us look at him. And was he a perfect man? We read before in James 5 that he was a man subject to passions just as we are. He was not a perfect man. Far from it, actually. And we'll look at that. Let's look at some of the comparisons that we can draw between Elijah and ourselves. When we look at Elijah's mission, we see that he had a work of restoration to fulfill given by God. At Mount Carmel, in 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 30, Elijah said unto the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar that was broken down, the altar of the Lord. You see, just as Elijah repaired the altar that was broken down, so we are called to be the repairers of the breach. We have a work of restoration to fulfill, just as Elijah had his. We see in the uh, verses coming after that he was to give the, one of the final calls to some of the people that were present. In 1 Kings 18, verse 21, Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. He was to bring the people to a decision. He was to give the last call. Just as we are to give the invitation to the people, we are to bring them to a decision for the Lord. We see that he was, able to, he was supposed to vindicate the character of God. And he did so. In verse 36, we see that it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. And in a nice turn of events, we see that in answer to his prayer, there was a great rain. Elijah experienced God's abundant rain. In verse 45, we see that in response to his prayer, it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. So as we look at some of the things that were in Elijah's life, we can draw some parallels to what is to come and what has been for our time. Right before all of these things that happened at Carmel, we know that there were about 1,260 days of famine and drought during that time. He had pronounced them. He prayed that there should be no rain to draw the people back to God. Now, that's interesting because there is a prophetic period of 1260 years in a, that ended in 1798. That is when our, within our time. He was to be the repairer of the breach. We are to be the restorers of the altar of God, of his law. He was to give some of those people the last call. And we see that they lost their life, the prophets of Baal. We are to give the last call to many. He was to stand at the mount and vindicate the character of God. And we are to do the same, to vindicate his character and his law. And to do so, we see that in answer to his prayer, he saw great rain from God, and we are promised the latter rain that will come on all of God's people in the last time. And for this reason, as we see the parallels between Elijah and ourselves, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5, we are told, God says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The spirit of Elijah that was then, the Holy Spirit that inspired him, is to inspire us in the same way to fulfill the same mission that he had, that we have to a greater extent in our day. But we look at his life, and there are some lessons to learn from his mistakes. Upon the eve of such a great victory, when he got Israel to to make a reformation, to gather back to the Lord... And he draws the chariot of the king, and the rain comes, and his prayer is answered. We see, on the eve of his great victory, something happens. What happens? We see fear seep in. And in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 2, Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life, as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And what is the response of the man of God who had just spent a whole day working for the people 
and slaying 850 men fearlessly, denouncing their, their heathenism, their sins, and the sins of the entire nation. How does he respond? In verse 4, we see that he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. I want us to take a moment, and as we consider the example of Elijah, let us look to our lives and see that we are no better. How many times has God given us great victories and we have proclaimed the name of the Lord and we have made a covenant with the Lord by surrender and in prayer? And then the next day, temptation comes. Satan attacks us when we are at our peak and we fall down just as he did. I look at my own life. You know, since my, since my baptism, since I made that covenant with the Lord, how many times have I fallen? How many times have each of us fallen just like Elijah? And we come to the point where we feel as if there is no more chance. And we say like he did, it is enough. And there is no more chance. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. I want us to look at him. When we look at the history of God's people, when we look at ourselves, when we look at how the Lord has delayed his coming for 200 years, giving us more and more time, and what are we doing with it? As we look at the record of our life, and we are discouraged, what is God's call to his faithful servant and to his fearful servant at this time? Let us look in uh, 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 5. We see that as he was laying there discouraged, fearful, and sleeping under the juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. What is the message of God to his fearful servant? What is the call? In verse 6 through 8, And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals, and the cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. I want us to draw a parallel from this uh, little sequence in Elijah's life. The message given to him was, Arise and eat and sleep and do it again. That's puzzling. But I want us to look at us. Could this pandemic that we have now, with the whole world locked down, be God's call to us to stay secluded a while? Arise and eat. And we're not talking about physical bread. We're talking about spiritual nourishment. Elijah needed to remember what the Lord had done for him. He needed, to re, he needed revival from the Lord. And the Lord provided him with spiritual meat and drink, as well as the physical this is the message given to his servants now, to his fearful servants. All around we see fear. The Lord says, arise, eat, and sleep, and eat some more. Strengthen yourself, for the journey is too great for thee right now. But we, God does not want us to stay there. We continue and we read in Desire of Ages, page 294, the Lord tells us, that God takes men as they are with the human elements in their character and trains them for His service if they will be disciplined and learn of Him. Listen. They are not chosen because they are perfect, but notwithstanding their imperfections, that through the knowledge and practice of the truth, through the grace and power of Jesus Christ, they may become transformed into His image. And I believe it was in those moments when Elijah was thinking and meditating and resting in the Lord and feeding upon His Word that God was transforming him from his fearful self into the image of the Lord. Christ wants to transform us today just as much as He wanted to transform Elijah. And we are told that in just a few days, we are told that He arose and He did eat and drink in 1 Kings 19 and verse 8, and he did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Wow. 
these words from this verse are not without significance. Forty days and forty nights, the Bible says. These, this time period that is given to us is found in a couple of other significant places in the Bible. When we look at where the 40 days and 40 nights comes to be, it draws a picture. Jesus went to commune with the Lord after his baptism. He went into the wilderness, and he was there being tempted 40 days and 40 nights. Noah's ark, when the flood came, we are told that rain came for 40 days and 40 nights. Moses learned in the wilderness in the school of being a shepherd for 40 years. Elijah marched for 40 days and 40 nights to the Mount of God, the same Mount Horeb, we are told, where Moses communed with God for 40 days and 40 nights. And we are told that as Moses received the law of the Lord, and as he communed with Jesus Christ, his face became shining as the sun. They needed to put a veil when he came back because the people were scared. These 40 days and 40 nights that God was preparing Elijah for, that Moses spent with the Lord, represent a time of testing, a time of purification, a time where the people of the Lord are strengthened in the power of Jesus Christ. This time is soon to come upon us, where we must go in the full strength of the Lord, where human strength cannot endure. We can only survive for a few days without water, but these men lasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And so, the victory of Elijah was greater than his defeat. The second victory was turned even greater. And so he was anointed and he was supposed to anoint the king and then his spirit he gave to Elisha and he was prepared by communing with the Lord on the Mount Horeb where he heard the voice of the Lord. He was prepared for being translated to heaven. Are we looking forward to the time of Jesus' second coming when he'll take us from this earth to be with him in heaven? We are to prepare as Elijah did. We are to have a similar experience that he had. And for this reason, in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, as we read, the Lord says, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The spirit and experience of Elijah is to be ours. His mission is to be ours, and we are to be prepared and transformed as he was. What's interesting about this verse, as we look in Malachi chapter 4, is that if we read just Malachi 4 verse 4, the previous verse before this, there's an association made with another example that we should follow. And if we read in Malachi chapter 4, starting verse 4, it says, Remember ye the law of Moses my servant which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, and I shall send you Elijah the prophet before that day. Just as Moses and Elijah were there present on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus Christ, so in Malachi we are giving them twin examples between the two of them. So I would like us to spend a little bit more time. Let's look now at Moses, the next person that the Redeemer would have us look for an example. Moses. How does Moses compare to us? What are some similarities that we can draw from our experiences? In Exodus, we read here that the Lord is speaking to Moses and he says, Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So he was to stand before the king. He was to be the deliverer of his people. Let's see if we can draw some parallels to our time. He was to stand before the legislative body of Egypt to, to speak on behalf of his people. In Matthew 24, we are told that we are called to do the same, to vindicate the law of the Lord before the great legislative councils of this earth. We see that following that, he experienced the plagues that God brought upon Egypt. The people of God will be present on earth when the plagues fall down. We are told that he led his people he led God's people out of Egypt. God calls us to be the royal priesthood that leads the world, that calls people to come out of spiritual Egypt. Following the great deliverance at the Red Sea, we are told that he sang the song of deliverance, the song of Moses and the Lamb. We are told in Revelation 
that the people of God will have a song to sing of their experience, the song of Moses and the Lamb. Following that great deliverance, Moses led his people to the promised land. And so God calls us to be the church and the people who invite, who give the last invitation call to lead the people to Jesus Christ, to prepare them for His second coming when we go to the promised heavenly Canaan. And that, I, as we look at their missions and how they were fulfilled in such a great manner, these examples of these men, what God did through them, they're some of the greatest in the whole Bible. How can we match up with them? In Matthew 17, that we are reminded of how they were present with Christ at the Mount of Transfiguration. How can we come to the point where we are seeing God face to face as they did when they appeared to Jesus Christ? How can we come to the same point? How? What does Moses represent in our time? Let us look in Desire of Ages, page 421 to see what example can we draw from Moses' life to prepare for this, to see God coming on the clouds. We are told that Moses, upon the Mount of Transfiguration, was a witness to Christ's victory over sin and death. He represented those who shall come forth from the grave at the resurrection of the just. Elijah, who had been translated to heaven without seeing death, represented those who will be living upon the earth at Christ's second coming, who will be changed in a moment in the tinkling of an eye. We are told as they were standing there with Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, upon the Mount, the future kingdom of glory was represented in miniature. Christ the King, Moses a representative of the risen saints, and Elijah of the translated ones. We see that through the example of these two men, they represent two classes who will be present at Jesus' second coming who will be present with Christ on the Mount of Victory, the risen saints, and those who will not have seen death. And when we look at the experience of Moses, just as we saw that Elijah was a man subject to passions as we are, what does Satan want to do with this great representative of God's people in Moses? We read in Numbers chapter 20 and verse 12, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Speaking to them, he said, Because you believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Have you ever thought, what did Moses do that was so bad that God saw fit to banish him from seeing uh, the promised land of Canaan? What was it in striking the rock that Moses did that was so bad that it says that you believe me not. It showed a, a lack of faith on the part of Moses. What was it that he did? When Moses struck the rock without God's instruction, we read in Patriots and Prophets, page 418, the significance of his act. By his rash act, Moses took away the force of the lesson that God purposed to teach. The rock, being a symbol of Christ, had been once smitten, as Christ was to be once offered. The second time, it was needful only to speak to the rock, as we have only to ask for the blessings in the name of Jesus Christ. By the second smiting of the rock, the significance of this beautiful figure of Christ was destroyed. We see in the example of Moses, in his great failure, that cost him the chance to see Canaan, we see the significance of it. It says, by his rash act, he diminished the lesson of the gospel that God wanted to teach his people. And I wanted to bring this to us. How many times have we destroyed the power of the gospel in our presentation to others? God has called us to be restorers to the breach, to give the last gospel call. And how many times have we, by our words, our actions, our influence, done the opposite, and we have diminished the power of the Lord's message? And we look back with shame in the, in the show of disbelief that we had, just as Moses did. And though he pleaded with the Lord, 
he was not granted the chance to see Canaan during his lifetime. Moses was not allowed to see that Canaan. Or was he? As we approach the conclusion of our study, we, let us look in the book of James, chapter 1, or rather Jude, I'm sorry, the book of Jude, verse 9, we see how does God react when Satan comes to claim Moses as his. After all the failure of Moses in diminishing the power of the gospel of Christ, Satan comes to the Lord, but we are told, in Jude 1, verse 9, Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, and he did not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. When Satan comes to, to take the body of Moses, to claim it as his own, when Satan comes to claim us as his own, the Lord says, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Why? How is it so? In Romans 8, 38, we read about what Moses, how was Moses able to, to be restored to the favor of the Lord? In Romans 8, 38, we are told, Paul says, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And the love of God that Moses had diminished in the lesson of the rock, the one that Elijah had forgotten, it was the same love that lifted them up, that transformed them, that reminded them, that lifted them up to a higher place and gave them a victory that was even greater than their defeat. And they were able to stand upon the mount with the Lord. And Moses, who could not see the Canaan during his lifetime, Christ brought him in his own lifetime to encourage Christ at that time. You see, before the crown must come the cross, we read in the Desire of Ages. And during that failure, it was the foundation upon which they built an even higher victory, Moses and Elijah. And God used them to do even greater things after their failure. Through the lesson of Moses, we see the mercy of Christ. In fulfilling his promise that, Moses, I will still take you to the promised land. And he died, but he was resurrected, taken to heaven, and then brought again when Jesus was alive on the mount. He stepped foot in that Canaan. And what was he doing there? What mission was given to these two men to fulfill when they were brought upon the Mount of Transfiguration? In the Zara of Ages, page 422, we are told that these men, these men chosen above every angel around the throne had come to commune with Jesus concerning the scenes of his suffering, to comfort him with the assurance of the sympathy of heaven, the hope of the world, the salvation of every human being was the burden of their interview. What do I want to draw from here? I want to emphasize how these imperfect men men subject to passions as we are, were chosen above the angel Gabriel, above the angel that surround the throne. They were chosen to send, to encourage Christ at a time of need, to encourage Him with the success of His sacrifice, to remind Him, Lord, we, we encourage You to go forward because without You, we cannot be where we are now. And your sacrifice will be worth it. And Christ was encouraged and he went forward with the cross. And before, after the cross came the crown, just as with these men. Did Satan succeed in using Moses to destroy the figure of salvation? No. God used Moses to emphasize his mercy and to show the strength of his salvation even more. And so he used Elijah and Moses, and so he will use us if we will let him. Our failures, our defeats may be the rock bottom on which God builds a foundation so strong that it will reach up to heaven at his second coming. We may see God now, we may see him at his second coming, we may be welcoming him. How are we to follow in the footsteps of Elijah and Moses? We read in Desire of Ages, page 297, 
we are to be laborers together with the heavenly angels in presenting Jesus to the world. With almost impatient eagerness, the angels wait for our cooperation, for man must be the channel to communicate with man. And listen to the promise that we are given. And when we give ourselves to Christ in wholehearted devotion, angels rejoice that they may speak through our voices to reveal God's love. The love that God showed through Elijah, through Moses, the love that He showed to them in transforming them and bringing them past their defeats and turning them to even greater victory is that same love that Christ is waiting to use, to speak through our lips, to manifest in our lives. You see, we are fighting a defeated foe. In Revelation 12, 10, John says, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our day, God day and night. Before the crown comes the cross. And God wants to make the experience of the cross so momentous. We may have the assurance of the peace of God. We may have the assurance of His love. We may be, go forward in the salvation of the Lord. We may be sure and we may be confident and we may be persuaded that nothing can remove us from the Lord. And we may be, go forward and preach to the world that Satan is defeated. And though we have sinned greatly and though we have failed, God's victory is greater than our sins. God's love is greater than our sins. And we may experience that salvation even now. And so I would like to invite everyone who is listening. Let us make a surrender. Let us use this time that God has given us to have more time at home in meditation and prayer. Let us use it to prepare for the 40 days of testing, of coming to the presence of our God. That when Jesus comes, we may say, this is our God. We have waited for Him, and He will save us. Amen. Let us bow our heads for a final prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before Thy throne of grace and want to thank You, Lord, for Your mercy. Thank You for giving us these two examples in Moses and Elijah, that, Lord, though they were imperfect and though they failed greatly, You turned their dishonor into greater victory still. And Lord, as we look at our lives and we see all the times we have failed and the many commitments and covenants that we have renewed, only to see them like ropes of sand be dashed, Lord, we don't want that to be our experience anymore. We want to have You in our hearts. We want to be used by You. We want to use this time to commune with You that people may see the brightness of Your love in our faces and in our lives. Prepare us, O oh Lord, for Your soon coming. In Jesus' holy name, amen.